Welcome to your Property Rights Podcast, proudly brought to you by Private Property. If you're looking for expert legal answers to all your property-related questions, then stay tuned. It's nice to have you listening. A warm welcome to your Property Rights Podcast, brought to you proudly by Private Property. I'm Paul Rotherham, and joining me in studio is the MD of SSLR Incorporated Attorneys, Silna Stain. Hello again, Silna. Hey, Paul. Always nice to share studio with you. And it's always lovely to have you here as our expert on property law, a specific focus on rentals and evictions. And do remember, SSLR Incorporated Attorneys has a national footprint. So wherever you are in the country, wherever you're clicking onto this Facebook post and listening to this podcast, uh, SSLR SLR Incorporated Attorneys will be able to assist you. Today, ah, a deep breath here because this is a little bit long, but I think it's very important, Silna, that I give you all the details here. Uh, This person writes as follows. My tenant is refusing to pay any increase in the deposit, although in the contract I have with him, it states that the deposit will increase when the rental increases. He's been living in my townhouse for about four years. In the beginning, he paid the rent on time. Hmm, We've heard this story before. But then he started paying later in the month, sometimes skipping months completely. He recently got a plumber out and deducted the amount from the monthly rental. I've seen no invoice even after asking for it. In our contract, it states that no repairs are to be undertaken without my consent. I do have insurance for that, writes this person. In January and February, he short paid the rental. He's been paying at the end of the month instead of the beginning. In August, there was no payment. September, no payment again. I've been sending letters to him every month about the outstanding amounts from January, and I've now sent him a seven-day letter of demand, stating that he will be asked to vacate and that he would be blacklisted should he refuse. He keeps saying he will pay, making promises, but is now ignoring WhatsApp messages and emails. Oh, this to me, unfortunately, I'm going to say this because I am a landlord myself and I've been in that circle. This is something that is not uncommon. This is a situation that presents itself very often between a landlord and a tenant. And so we do have a few questions specifically from this listener. His first question is, and I can sense the exasperation here, how much more notice do I need to give him? Paul, this is, well, this is exactly the kind of questions that I make a living from. So when you rental and eviction expert attorney, this is what I deal with every day. So I'm quite comfortable and in my comfort zone with this question. What I do want to mention is I think the start of the question dealing with the deposit is the least of this listener's problems. I think the deposit is almost that after the fact, so if you can just leave that part of the question for me until the very end, we can deal with the deposit, which is anyway not going to be um, topped up or used in any way. But um, the question right now is, how much more notice must I give the person? Now, what, what I find interesting here is very often I see landlords doing so many things, but the one thing that they're not doing is the right thing. They're doing a lot of letters, a lot of WhatsApp messages, and none of those things will actually get you to the point where you want to be. And to be honest, the point where you want to be is to cancel this lease agreement, get the tenant to change from a tenant into an illegal occupant. Hopefully, he will move out, but if he doesn't, at least then we can commence eviction proceedings. Because we can't go to court with an eviction unless we've canceled the lease agreement. And what I'm hearing from this question is, this hasn't happened. This is a month-to-month agreement. So this notice is potentially not even necessary if the landlord is willing to just write off all the arrears. The easiest way of, of getting this person to no longer have a right to occupy the property is to give one month's written notice in terms of the Rental Housing Act when it comes to a month-to-month agreement give him a calendar month's written notice of termination of the month-to-month agreement. Yeah, it's important that you do not use the word cancellation, but termination. We can basically do a full episode just on the difference between termination and cancellation. But just in short, just to, to frame my answer, termination is a natural end to your contract. So a month-to-month agreement ends when one of the parties give the other one a month's notice of termination. 
Cancellation is an act to breach. And this is also an option this landlord had. And to be quite honest, the first month your tenant doesn't pay or the first month your tenant pays late, you need to get a letter of demand out. Now, a letter of demand is very specific. In this case, it's a month to month agreement. So section 14 of the consumer protection cannot apply. So seven days is perfect. However, if it is a fixed term agreement and there is a natural person, so a person in their name, not two juristic entities, then section 14 will apply. And then unfortunately, we need to give 20 business days notice to remedy your breach. But that is not your letter of demand isn't a notice of cancellation. It is time for the tenant to remedy his breach pays a rear rent, start complying with the conduct rules, whatever his form of breach is, he has seven days to fix that. Only if he doesn't can you cancel the agreement. And then we can start the eviction process if the person does not vacate. So that was a very long answer to a relatively short question, but I think it's quite important to realize that this listener feels like I've been doing everything, I've been doing so much, and the sad part is none of that except now potentially for the letter of demand that was done recently is the correct thing. The easiest way and just a, a tip out there for, for the listeners, um, TPN Tenant Profile Network does have a system where you can generate a letter of demand. I'm actually the drafting attorney of that letter, so I know the content pretty well. And it's very cost effective. You don't have to go to an attorney, but it's very important that the content of that letter is perfect, especially if you have to give 20 business days notice. If you then get to an attorney and they say the content was wrong, you didn't clearly state what the breach was and what the effect would be if you do not remedy in time. Unfortunately, that letter means absolutely nothing. And unfortunately, I can say this, none of your WhatsApp messages or anything else that's not done in terms of the lease agreement is any way worth anything. So those literally carry no weight at all. Exactly. Assuming that this now does go to court and, and notwithstanding what you've said about what is valid and, and not valid and legal and not legal, let's assume this were to go to court now. The question that is coming here is, would this person be liable for the costs? And my assumption would be uh, go to court for either the uh, arrear rental collection or for an eviction or both. And the answer is every single time in our courts in South Africa, your court order, your cost order, in terms of your court order, will always follow the unsuccessful party. Unless there's something funny. But most of the times, your cost will follow the unsuccessful party, meaning the tenant, illegal occupant now, will have to pay the cost of that. But in fairness, practically, I think by now you've seen yep. that I'm a, a practical person. Very much so. The fact that you have a court order demanding and ordering that this person must pay the legal cost doesn't mean you can send him your attorney's bill. Now you have to appoint the taxing master, which is somebody sitting at the, the high courts and the magistrate courts. You need to submit your bill of costs. And once you have submitted your bill to the taxing master, the taxing master then compares your fees uh, billed by your attorney to the cost scale that your court order allowed. So if your, if your co co court order said the um, tenant illegal occupant must pay costs on a party and party scale, it's much it's a much lower scale than what your attorney charged. This is 100% legal. It's very similar to medical aid rates okay. versus private the, the practitioner rates. The real rate rates. versus, yes, I'm exactly. with you. I'm with so you. the same thing. But now you have this tax bill. This now costs you a load of money as well because you had to get a cost consultant. You had to tax your bill of cost. Even though you can issue a warrant of execution on the back of that, what are the chances of actually getting money out of this person? I was just going to say, and I don't want to cut you short because you've always got so many good things to say, but there are a couple more questions I want to get to. And I was just going to say, here your tenant is, they haven't been paying rent. If you honestly think that you're now going to be able to get the money out of them for covering legal fees and costs, you're going to go nuts because that could take you years. Exactly. And I know that um, there's, there's so much we can get our teeth into here, but j just to speed it up a little bit, if you don't mind, Silna, moving Perfect. on to the next question. 
would this person, the landlord in this case, be able to claim interest on the outstanding rentals that haven't been paid from the tenant? How does that work in a nutshell? Very good question. That is also only at the time where you issue your letter of demand will your murder interest start running. Your so what mur- interest? <laughs> murder interest. Is this, is this tomorrow or, <laughs> or is this another Latin word? <laughs> it's another Latin word. And murder means default. So your default interest rate is usually around 10%, but it changes like the interest rate does. But the murder interest rate about it, you can charge that from the date of sending your letter of demand Or in terms of your lease agreement, you're allowed to charge 2% per month to a maximum of 24% per annum. If your lease agreement does allow for this, if not, you're only entitled to your murder interest if you demand it from your letter of demand. Otherwise, only from the time where your attorney issues the summons. Okay. And a quick question here. We've ascertained that this is not a contract, um, but it is a month-to-month agreement. What are your thoughts as a legal expert specific to rental and, and things that are in keeping with that. What are your thoughts on having a month-to-month agreement? Is that something that we should actually be steering away from? Is a long-term rental better? Any thoughts on that, just as some advice? Yes, all the thoughts you can imagine. Um, a month-to-month agreement does not necessarily mean that it's a verbal agreement. A verbal agreement will always be a month-to-month agreement, but um, they could, you could have a written month-to-month agreement and there's quite a few benefits in that. Actually, uh, we've mentioned the TPN lease pack lease before. Uh, one of the leases as part of that lease pack, which, which I'm obviously uh, one of the drafting attorneys of, is a month-to-month agreement. The reason why some investors prefer a month-to-month agreement is then your lease agreement is not governed by Section 14 of the CPA. That's one of the biggest benefits. So if somebody doesn't pay rent, you can give him seven days to remedy instead of 20 business days. On the other hand, you don't have, uh, you don't know for a fact how long somebody is going to mm. be there. So if you buy a property and you're planning to, say, for instance, make a few renovations and then resell it, definitely, then I would use a month-to-month agreement and then 100% encourage that that would be in writing. Um, longer term agreements, it depends on, on the kind of landlord that you are and your requirements. Same for the tenant. As long as your lease agreement is in writing, which is not a requirement in law, but trust me, if your lease agreement's not in writing, it makes it quite difficult to act in terms of that agreement uh, when it's a verbal agreement. So whether it's month to month or longer term lease, always have it in writing. In writing. I think the one thing we've learned from your property rights podcast, or at least this edition, is if there are any problems, if anything starts going haywire, sort it out straight away. Act now. Don't wait. As we heard from this listener, uh, this person, the the landlord, uh, I beg your pardon, the tenant, um, has been short paying for close on a year now. Uh, And as you say, sending a WhatsApp or a smoke signal or a slip of paper under the door simply isn't the right way of sorting the problem out. Exactly, and it won't help you in court at all. Silna Stain, thank you very much for joining us for another episode. It's only a pleasure. Brought to you by Private Property. It is your property rights podcast. I'm Paul Rotherham, and please do join us again for another episode coming soon to this platform. And remember, if you have any comments on this topic, if you'd like to raise a topic, if you'd like to ask a question or give your thoughts, join in the conversation with us. That's what it's all about with this private property podcast. We'd love to include you and involve you. And we look forward to seeing your comments. Your Property Rights Podcast is proudly brought to you by Private Property. Leave a comment or ask a question to join the conversation.